um, Michelle, I think that I'm going to conjure up my inner Meryl Streep. And she said, well, if you're going to conjure up your, inner, your Meryl Streep, then you better wear a red dress, which is why I'm wearing a red dress. But then, you know, the funny thing is I said, if I'm going to wear the red dress, I'd better conjure up someone else, and that's uh, Sarah Blakely. Does everyone know who Sarah Blakely is? Spanx, CEO and founder of Spanx, okay? She is the first and only female-owned, a, a female self-made billionaire, the only one. So I have her here today to thank. The other person that I wanted to conjure up is Amy Cuddy. Are you familiar with Amy Cuddy? Yeah. She, right? And what does she talk? She talks about power poses, right? So we're just starting out. I want everyone to stand up, okay? Just humor me a little bit this morning about getting our energy up. So anyway, what Amy Cuddy says is that we can actually change the way the pe people see us and the way we feel about ourselves by the way that we pose and the confidence we have. So what we're going to do today is everyone's going to do Superman pose. Like this. Right? You, your legs have to go apart a little bit, right? Look at each other. How, do you feel it? Are you conjuring up? Do you feel powerful today? Okay. Now you can sit down. When I was thinking about speaking about women and power, um, uh, women and leadership, power is naturally a part of it. And how do we, especially in a world where there were so many, at least when I start, so few role models that we did have. Um, and, and right now, with what's happened uh, with the Me Too movement, right, and Time's Up movement, uh, we have a momentum that we never had before. But my first dose of reality to you is don't think for a minute that things are changing just because of the Me Too movement, movement or the Time's Up movement. Things are changing, and I believe that they are changing fast and furiously. It's been described as a tsunami for women. I love that, a tsunami for women. But what that means is it comes in quickly. So we can't look to the past, but we can use the momentum of what's happened and think about how are we going to show up going forward and how we, are we going to use this for our benefit. And I will tell you today that it is all tied to economics and money and power. And the beauty is that we are at the forefront as women. Okay? And that the, I want you to think about for instance, corporations and organizations, because that's where 85% of the top leadership are men. And it's changing for a few reasons. One, revenues. Any business has to continue to increase revenues. And guess who are the biggest purchases? Women. 75% of the influences for purchases are women. Okay? Tell me who is the man who invented jockeys, jockey straps. Well, I don't know who it is either, but you know, but we know Spanx, right? Women are purchases. Women spend money, and, they ha and that money is power. If a company, a CEO, has to look to the future and looks at the studies, they know that their best customer is a female. And it, they have to start to respond to it, and they are. And you've seen things like Nike and Adidas, right? Last week was Women's Leadership uh, Day, right? Did you see the McDonald's sign? They turned the arch upside down with a W. It, it's coming. The other thing is in terms of profits. And when you talk about operating profits, uh, you're talking about our human resources. And the, the fact is that the baby boomers are retiring at the rate of about 10,000 people per day. They have been predominantly uh, white males. And over the next five years, it's believed that the workforce will make up about 75% will be women and minorities. And so when I'm talking today about women, but the numbers are even better when you add minorities. But this is a seminar about women. The other thing I want to say is I'm not discounting the benefit of having male mentors. I've had many male mentors in my life, my father, my husband, 
teachers, professors, law professors, and you cannot underestimate the value of that. It's just that this is a seminar about women mentoring women, right? So uh, in terms of, of that, the other thing is engagement. And the study I'm looking at, it was a study done by Gallup, Gallup Pauls. It was a study as well as a survey. And it says that the biggest crisis in this country today, and it actually worldwide, is, uh, is um, a crisis of engagement. 33%, one-third of the workforce says they're engaged at work, whereas 51% say they're not engaged and 16% say they are actively disengaged in what they do. So what does that mean for us as women? I think the, the, the big takeaway is that as women, we are much better on the engagement side. And if you look at some, I, I read a book, The Athena Doctrine. Has anyone heard of that book? Okay, it's done after a worldwide study. And what they said was that the traits, the feminine traits, like honesty, collaboration, communication, which are typically feminine traits, will be the future leaders, okay? Now that doesn't mean it'll be just women, right? Because men can have those traits too. But it means that those traits that come to us naturally are what is needed in the new economy. So that's good news, right? I think my next seminar may be women mentoring men. I have to teach them some of those skills, right? But beyond that, if you can't wait for your organization to change, you have another opportunity, and that's start your own business, right? Entrepreneurship. Women entrepreneurship is up at a rate of about two and a half times what typical businesses are in the last five years. There are so many women in startups and uh, starting their own business. I started my own firm in 1995, and I started it in a um, basement office with a part-time secretary. And part of the reason I started it was that work-life balance back in 1995 was important to me. I had, I had lots of kids, and I could not do it the way the other, the other people have done it. I graduated seventh in my class at, in, in Hofstra Law, and by the way, I gave birth in my second year of law school. And I could not see myself in that climate of a New York City law firm. And in fact, I walked out of uh, an, a, an interview at one of the big firms because I couldn't imagine how I was going to be both people, right, a mother and also be a lawyer. And it was very difficult to do because we are so geared up. We go to school, we, and, and I thought for sure that that was what I wanted to do. And in the end, I came out here at a huge pay cut. And even working at the time, um, there were all the firms were run by men and the majority of men. By the way, our firm today is the largest, I think it's the only all-female law firm in the tri-state area. We have 38 women working in our firm. No men, but we will accept men. We just don't have any right now. Um, so the thing is that I had to make that choice. By the way, when I was in law school, when we interviewed for those big firms, you know what we wore? We wore suits from Wallachs made of men's suiting material. We wore white blouses and these bow ties that we wore up to here, which is why I like to wear a red dress now. Because now I can do it my way. But what I want to talk to you about today is really the three different phases that I went through. There's nothing scientific about it. It's my story. So as they say, take what you want and leave the rest. Um, but it's, it's the best advice and the best mentoring I can bring to you. And the three stages I have, well, we could call them one, two, and three. That's pretty simple, right? So the first stage, and I see a lot of young people here, and I get it from a lot of the young people that I mentor, is where do you start, right? We go to school, we go to college, maybe you've gone to law school, but you come out and you don't even know, how am I going to do this? Whether you have kids yet or you don't have kids, you're thinking about having kids, where do I begin? And my best advice to you is you start with who do I want to be, right? Now you would think I'd say, 
what do I want to do? But no, what I'm telling you is that you need to find a mission that is bigger than yourself. And that may sound corny, but I will tell you and I'll show you that it has helped me every step of the way. And that means you need to develop habits and routines that further that mission. And you need to come with an overwhelming enthusiasm for whatever you do, right? And it may not be in that job you have today, but that doesn't mean there aren't other things that you can do to further your mission. And somehow they come to, to, um, to fruition. And really it has to do with engagement. Remember I spoke about employees and the lack of engagement? It starts with us and who we are and who we want to be. So I would encourage you when you get out of school and you're no longer looking for that A or, or that next class and what's prescribed for you, to find the things that speak to you. There's a professor at Wharton School of Business, his name's Stuart Friedman. He's probably one of the most beloved professors there, maybe after Adam Grant. And he wrote the book of Living the Life You Want. And what he says is that we need to develop a whole life, okay? And it means touching on different parts of ourself, our personal, so personal well-being, family, business, and community. And that any time that those circles of concern interlap, you're winning, right? You're winning because you're able to touch each one. So for instance, if, uh, when I got out of law school and I thought, gee, I need to really have some other interests, I thought, well, I'll learn about art. And I went to the museum because they have the best art books for children, and I bought children's art books. And I brought them home and I read them to my kids. And then I took my kids to the museum. And that was a way for me to expand my personal well-being. It was a good family event. And guess what? It helped me to be more engaged when I was in that conference room with my clients, right? Beware of social media and what it does to you. If you spend all your time looking at what other people are doing, you are not living your best self. Okay, and that I think is one of the reasons that we do have a lack of engagement. And, and the other thing is that I found that there were other ways, even later on, for instance, in my business, we had an Alzheimer's walk that we sponsored. We're elder law attorneys. Man, we hit all the buttons, right? It was a 5K, it was personal fitness and well-being, it was a family day, it was for the community, and it was good for the business. Win, 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 win. It was fantastic. So my best advice for you in that phase one where you're trying to figure it out is to remember, who do I want to be? And to do it with enthusiasm, okay? Now there came a time when I got to the second phase, okay? And that was the phase when maybe I was in business for 10 years or more. And I had a staff now, right? Got out of the basement. We had maybe 14 employees. Is there water here? Oh, <laughs> you see? Th this will go to why you need a personal assistant. Oh, Michelle's much more than that. She runs me, but. <laughs> right in front of you. That was good, Michelle. <laughs> it falls right into this next uh, line. So uh, now I have a staff of maybe 14, 15. I have someone who handles just the finances. We're doubling business every year, right? We're really killing it. And I have a personal assistant. And she's not only my personal assistant, she does some of the Medicaid work. She basically has taken over my life for me. She takes care of my kids, she pays my mother's bills. You name it, she does it for me. It's fantastic. At the same time, I'm expanding my horizons beyond the lore. I'm reading, uh, and I told you, being a lifelong learner is very important. I read every business book, mostly written by men though, uh, about business and organizations. And I just started reading about Zappos, and you know, Zappos has a tremendous uh, system out there. And they had what was called the happiness bus, and their program was happiness in the workplace. And so I was buying into that, and I was thinking, this is great, because as I do more things, I need my team to do other things. 
The problem was the nightmare assistant, which some of you might say was a dream assistant. She was doing everything for me. But the only problem was she didn't share my values. She didn't treat my staff the same way I did. And one day I heard it, and to be fair, it's probably not the first time that I heard her speak harshly to someone, but it was the first time I listened, and I was horrified. I was horrified. It was right before Labor Day, and I called her in, and I said, I need to fire, I, 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 you need to go home for a week, and I need to think about this. That's how important she was to me. And believe me, family, friends, people who worked for me, no one believed that I was going to fire her. Nobody, right? And that was my dark night of the soul, because I had to decide what I have to decide. Not what I was going to do, but who I wanted to be, right? And I didn't want to be that person. And I had put her in that position of power. I'd given up my power to her. And I was going to have to put on my big girl pants and figure out how I was going to do this going forward if I was going to build a team. And that's what I did when she came back. And it was a defining moment in my life. And you're going to see it too. You have to make some hard choices of what's comfortable and not comfortable. <clears throat> and on the personal side, because again, it's personal, it's business, it's the same. I was in the midst of what I call, we all call, the mommy wars. Anybody have kids here? Uh, it was, I was especially sensitive to it because I grew up in the 60s and 70s and my mom worked. And believe me, back then, no women worked. And my mom was a travel agent, so she traveled to Greece and she traveled to France and she's traveled all over the world. Um, in fact, once she came home from Paris wearing uh, hot pants, uh, fishnet stockings, uh, what are they? Thigh high patent leather boots and a long trench coat. This is 1968. She, she rocked it. She looked really good. But, you know, I was angry. I thought she should have been home taking care of me, doing my homework, and baking cookies like all the other mothers. So I was angry when she went. My sister, who's here today, was grateful she always came home. Right. Two different perspectives. So when I became a mother and had to work and, and did, wanted to work full time, I was going to do it different. Right? I was going to make sure I had someone at home. My kids were not going to be latchkey children. And I still, I still suffered. And you know, when I think about the Me Too movement, I think one of the things we need to learn is to accept everyone for the choices that they make. Right? And I don't discount anyone who stays home. That is a difficult job. We all know it. We've all done it. And I thank, right today, I'm going to thank every woman that helped me with my kids that were there in the classrooms or took care of the Frost Valley trip, right? Or, or put together the sweetheart dance because they brought a real sense of community and my kids benefited for, from it. By the same token, I need to give myself a break too, because we all bring our own gifts to the world, right? And I like to think I pay it forward. And I pay it forward maybe it's someone who was one of my law students, right? Or one of my interns, or someone who works for me, or, or someone, and maybe even a mother returning to work that I can help. And I think that if the Me Too movement has told us every, uh, anything, it's that we need to stand up and support each other for our choices. Would you agree? Now, the funny thing is, you know, my mom tried to redeem herself during this period, and uh, actually, she's a little bit old, she's my age, and she came to visit me, but I was still in the throes of trying to be the perfect mother. And she said to me, I'll help the, uh, Kira with her, her report today. And um, I said, okay. I was a little nervous. And I came home about 10 o'clock at night. I was exhausted. And Kira reads me the report about the Pentagon. And it says, the Pentagon was so big that they wore roller skates to get around. I was like, where did you get? Well, Nanny told me that. I was, Mom, where did you? I don't know. I read it somewhere. <laughs> she strikes again. Now the third, so that's my second, uh, my second stage, okay? And it's all about who you want to be. And, and who you want to be is important on the personal side, right? Because you, gotta steal, you have to stand firm when you're faced with thinking that every other mother in the community is a better mother than you are, 
right? Or they're trying to steal your child or, or somehow you failed. We need to forgive ourselves and really understand who we are. So doing that work in the first stage is important for the second stage. Now the third stage is my, this is the, my passion. I talk about it now. It's, it is the third stage. I call it the third age, okay? And so when you talk about childhood, Adolescence, and by the way, adolescence, that term was only coined in the 1920s when one, parents started to live long, longer, they, there was an industrial revolution and there was actually time for people in their lives to experience an adolescence, right? Then we go to adulthood, we go to middle age, and then we have old age. The only problem is people are living well beyond their 90s today right? The largest growing segment of the population are people over 90. So what are you going to do? After 50, you could live another 30 or 40 years. So I want people, again, to pay attention. How are you going to live these years? And there's a shift, just like there was a shift from being independent to learning my interdependence, there is a shift in the third age. And if you don't pay attention to it, you're going to miss it. And that shift was described in, remember Betty Friedan in the 60s, right? The feminine mystique? Well, when we, she was 59, she took a gap year. Yep, a gap year at 59. She went to Harvard for a year. And she wrote a book called The Fountain of Age. And that's the first time I heard the word generativity, which described this period in life. I'm going to actually read it to you. Generativity is a concern for the future, the need to nurture and guide younger people and contribute to the next generation. And that's the shift that people in the third age are, are starting to feel. And the problem is if we go straight to retirement, which, by the way, is a new, relatively new term from the 60s, we miss that whole period. And in fact, if you look at a happy, the happiness curve that the uh, social scientists have uh, developed, we actually start up here when we're younger, and it's a decline until we're about in our 40s in happiness. We're at our lowest point somewhere in our 40s. So if you're at that age and you're not feeling good, it, it's only going up from here. <laughs> Older people are actually happier. And uh, the other thing is there's a great book out by... Um, uh, his name is Joe Coughlin, and he's the director of the Age Lab at MIT. And what he does is does studies for large corporations and communities, and his, his hope is, uh, is and the uh, mission of the um, MIT lab is to make things better um, and see what's going on and to make aging better, right? And he gives the example of how out of touch corporations uh, innovators who tend to be younger and male are with respect to this age group. And he talks about, do you ever see the commercial for Medic Alert? Help, I'm falling, somebody help me, I can't get up, right? Well, that's a great marketing tool, right? As opposed to, he says, Alexa, right? Which is used for the full population. You don't have to say, hey, I'm old, I need help getting up. You say, Alexa, call a cab. Alexa, call, call my daughter. And, he, and, the, and the other thing that he talks about, and, and Friedan does too, is that we are still on that, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And that the baby boomers have set the stage for every generation that they've been in. And it's no different now. And guess who are the big purchases in the baby boomers? They're women. Women. They buy for their families, they bought for their parents, they buy for themselves. And that market is worth $521 trillion. And it's more than the millennial market that everyone's marketing to. So he says we need to be, we need to be looking up. And if we're talking about the third age and we're talking about these people, they're at their best. And we need to be looking at self-realization and other hierarchical needs. I mean, let's face it, if we have the most money, we've got food, shelter, and clothing covered, right? And what he also says is that women are going to be at the forefront of that, which brings me back to why the tsunami is coming. So I'd like to just read to you, because it gives me goosebumps when I read it, what he says, okay? 
There's a group of consumers living out on the cutting edge of age. They're intimately acquainted with the real challenges that can pop up in later life, as well as what can go right. And yet, insanely, this group is grossly underrepresented in the sorts of critical industry positions that have the potential to change the business of old age. The people I'm talking about are women of middle age and older. Speaking generally, female consumers will define the future of old age through their personal experiences, insights, and economic demand. Within that number, there is a select set of entrepreneurs, independent operators, as well as innovators within larger organizations with the insights needed to guide us toward a radical, improved vision of later life. The future will be gray, female, and proud of it. And that's from a professor from MIT. So if you don't, if you don't think the tsunami's coming, it is, and it's coming for every one of us. And what we'll use is the tools that we've used all along. And what I say to, to the seniors that I speak to and the people that are my age is you do what I tell the younger people to do. Find a mission and a purpose that is bigger than yourself. And you know, the longevity studies show that people live longer and healthier when they have meaning and purpose in their lives. And <clears throat> There's something called kedging. I read in a book called Younger Next Year. I love that title, Younger Next Year. And he talks about kedging. Um, and, and that has to do with setting up routines and habits that further your mission. The same thing I told phase one to do, right? And to continue doing phase two. And so kedging is when they, the ships were old and they didn't have good navigation or machinery, what the, they could get stuck in the irons. They could be there for hours or days. So what would happen is the crew would take a long boat out with a motor, go farther out, and they would pull the big ship in. And then they would go further out and, and take the boat out of the irons. So what he suggests is that we do the same thing, only it's a lot more fun. So for instance, if I go, and, which I did two years ago, and say, I'm going to take up yoga. I'm going to do yoga every day. But I need some incentive. So I signed up to go to a yoga camp in El Salvador. I went to, um, to Greece, to Mykonos last summer uh, for a yoga camp. And it could be like I talked about with my kids. I want to learn about art. OK, I'll get the books. I'll learn it from one, and I'll take my kids. Again, doing the same things we did before. It's not time to close up shop and move to Florida. It's time to bring our gifts here. And we, as women, are the ones who are going to do it. And you know, when I got done, I was up in uh, skiing um, last week when I was writing this, and I thought, you know, the three things I spoke about today are really things my mother taught me. One, she said, Nancy, fair, fair, what is fair? She'd say it over and over again. And you know, it wasn't that she thought life shouldn't be fair. What she thought was that I shouldn't be disillusioned because life wasn't fair. That I need to keep going. And the second thing she told me was it's three steps forward and, and two steps back. And she told me that, again, not because she was negative. She was the most positive person I knew. But she wanted me to keep going, because it is a zigzag. It's not always oh, you, 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 you're winning and that's it. You have good days, you have bad days, uh, things happen, you have a setback, but you have to keep going. And you've got to go back to the steps I told you. Review what your mission is, what's your purpose, and are you, are you uh, furthering it? right? And measure all your activities and your commitments against what that greater mission is. And the third thing she told me was that the only independence is financial independence. And I told you that money is power and that's what's driving this movement. But the funny thing is, you know, you're never too old to learn. So I left, I went up on the ski slope um, and I'm going up the, uh, the mountain and I'm thinking about my mother, and I'm thinking about what she did and really how engaging she was. And she was a lifelong learner. She would read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the News, the Post, you name it, before I even woke up in the morning. And if she got done with those, she was reading National Ge Geographic. And she was very engaging. There's that word again. And as I'm going up the slope, 
I actually had an epiphany. It's like all of a sudden the clouds parted and the sun came out. I couldn't wait to get off the slope. I, I jumped off, I skied down, I went to my car, I grabbed my phone, and I did something I couldn't do in 1995. I Googled the Pentagon. And it said the Pentagon was 6.6 .6 million square feet, which may make it easier to understand why before there were telephones at every desk and before email, some messengers took to the hallways on roller sk skates. <laughs> <laughs> so she may have not given me what I wanted, but she sure as hell gave me what I needed. Thank you. question was when I decided to go to law school, and by the way, I was 28 when I went to law school, and I already had two kids, three stepchildren, and um, I had that third baby and then another one who's in here afterwards. So <laughs> th this is actually funny because we're at Stony Brook. I was a math major. I was taking all the calculus, the pre-math, you know, uh, and I loved math. And I thought, no, it's 1988. What could you do with a math uh, major? Do you, you know, uh, does this lost on you that Renaissance, the largest hedge fund, was born out of the math department at Stony Brook? So, like I said, three steps forward, two steps back. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll be a lawyer because maybe I can make enough money. I needed to make money for my kids. And I, there was another reason. I wanted a voice. And I felt discounted at the time. My husband's a builder. He's here today. And we were building houses, and I was helping him, and I was dealing with the banks. And um, they didn't want to talk to me. They wanted to talk to him. So I thought, well, if I get a degree and I'm a lawyer, people will start to listen to me. And I wanted to be heard. And that's how it happened. Yes? Well, you know, because I, I live for that, uh, we have a policy in our office that if, if your kids get sick, you stay home, right? And you make it up. And, and I don't want to micromanage you. You make it up. Um, and if your kids have a recital, then you go to the recital. You don't miss those things. And when I talk about uh, living the life you want, about touching all those bases, uh, apart from the sick part, which which means that you know you, you've you've got to be a presence in what's happening, and there's got to be change in how we look at our employers, our, our employees. And I'm telling you, it's on the rise. It may not, it may be too late for you with your employer right now, but you need to take a leadership position to change that. Because, and 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 I guess that was my first point: is you need to take the study done by American Express 2017 on the state of women-owned businesses and the Gallup poll on the state of American workforce that talks about 51% being um, disengaged and 16% not engaged. And you need to read that and you need to take that to your employer. Right? Because not everyone is as uh, illuminated about that. And so don't, we, the argument isn't it's the fair thing to do, right? The argument is to make an economic argument that if you don't want to lose your most valuable uh, resource, which is your human resources, which is going to be 75% women and minorities, then you need to respond to them. 
right? So that's on an activist level. On a personal level, I would find things, and that's what I did. You know, I, I was an elder law attorney, so often I had to go to nursing homes and hospitals to see people. So the deal with my kids was that on Saturday, help me clean the house. I'd take them to the city, but in between, we'd have to stop at a few nursing homes. <laughs> Robin does that today. <laughs> And so you're constantly negotiating, and you find those events and those things that bring you together uh, with your kids, things that serve your purpose, because you can't, you know, like, how many times can, you know, you play checkers or whatever the heck they play? Uh, you know, you, you need to find things that engage you and engage them at the same time so that you have that space and that trust that you build up over time. And now I can't get rid of my kids. No, I'm not kidding. They dragged me to India for two weeks. I had no intent to go in, but when they said, will you come, I, I had to go. I just got back. Um, so uh, you have to, that's hard. You know, that's why I didn't take the, the, the job in the city. I walked out, there's an associate there telling me all the hours I'd have to work. He didn't know I was pregnant at the time. And I thought, oh my God, well, who's going to be with my kids? And I stood up and I said, I'm sorry, I don't want this job. You know, and Hofstra was mad because only like 20 people interview with the big firms, right? And that was one job and I walked out. Uh, they forgave me later because I went back and taught there. But had to know that that was, I couldn't juggle that. Maybe some of my friends could and they could work all night is what I call macho time. You know, there's an article last week that said the best workers are the people who don't work the most hours, but they work smart. And part of knowing who you are, the next question is, what do I bring to this organization? What's my gift, right? And if you can figure that out, and then you arm yourself with facts, and you find the decision maker where you work, try and get a little bit more in terms of what they do on the work, on the work side, on your employer side. But it's coming. Or start your own business. Or come work for the Bernal Law Group. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Okay, thank you. Oh, wait, oh, I have a question. Yeah. Well, it's not now. The tsunami hasn't come. You, right now, you're in the dry period, okay? That's why it's a tsunami. Over the next five years, when the workforce and, and people who are making decisions change, it will change. And like I said, if you want to come quicker, you may have to choose another plan, which is not being part of that organization. I didn't say this was going to be easy, and I didn't say it was going to be fair. So you have to decide, who am I? You know, when I walked out of that job interview, which was unheard of in 1988, and believe me, we were broke. We could use the money. The starting pay was $92,000. I started a job in Riverhead at $18,000. And they wouldn't take me to lunch because I was a woman. Okay? So I took those hard choices. In the end, did it turn out for me? Yes, it did, but I'm not saying three steps forward, two steps back. I don't know how it's going to be. And if you can't, if you can't find that place that allows you to juggle and that's your tipping point or that's your, your point where it's no good, then you need to find another way to do it, right? I don't have a magic solution other than to be proactive, try and change the organization you're in, be industrious, start your own firm, or decide that those things aren't as important, right? There's no magic, there's no magic solution here. But don't lose faith, I think it's coming.
Anyone else? Yes. 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 In fact, what I, uh, what I had on my notes, which I didn't say, is that because I'm talking about women, mentoring women, I'm talking about women, but the actual numbers are skewed even more when you add minorities to it. And that's part of the tsunami because the makeup is changing. Right? When you look around the room, I, I mean, I read something where there's this very successful company, uh, the, the board was there, and the, the leader looked around and there were seven white men there. Chances are in five to ten years from now, that's not what is going to be there because that's not what the makeup of the workforce is. But you know, other than being proactive and not thinking this is just going to happen because it's the fair thing. It's going to happen because we need to arm ourselves with the statistics and the facts. The facts are that women are much better in engagement and they tend to be much more engaged at work. And so if you're the leader and you're the person running that team and you want top performance, then you're going to engage that team and you're going to worry about like I do that my people come to work. We have a mission statement we put together after I went to Zappos. And by the way, this speaks right to it. When I was, I went to Zappos three years ago, it was a boot camp for leaders. And it was called Happiness in the Workplace, right? And there are CEOs from all over the world, Japan, Australia, uh, teachers from South Side of Chicago, credit unions in, in uh, California. And I think I was the only lawyer there and certainly the only sole practitioner. And after the four days of team building and talking about how important it is to listen, listen to, uh, to understand, right, to know what the needs of your people are, to have flexibility, everyone sort of like, you know, at the, the ending ceremony was how do I go back and prove to the people I have to deal with, my partners, my boss, the CEO, that this stuff really works and it's really important. And I stood up and I said, you know, the beauty for me is I don't have to go back and ask anyone. I could just go back and do it, right? So I realized that I come from a unique place because I I'm the boss and I get to change policy. But I'm just telling you that the change is coming. If you want it, then you need to arm yourself with the facts that you need to do it and show them why it's important for this to happen. We have some lawyers now that had babies, and you know, I have a lot of millennials. So talk about a tsunami. We're going to have people going out on maternity leave, and we've increased our maternity leave to three months paid uh, leave. And I wonder, you know, how am I going to do? One thing is remote access, right? And so now we're doing all the research on remote access. And one of the things I found out this week is that you get an average of four hours more productivity from someone who works remotely, which I didn't know. Now, how we're going to manage it, I don't know, but we're going to figure it out because that's what's coming too. So I think you need to educate yourself because no one's going to hand it to you, right? Okay, thank you.